Um, and I want to start off with some disclosures. Uh, I'm not here to impress you with my speaking skills, so you'll notice if you know anything about public speaking, I'm breaking all the public speaking rules. I'm not pausing for inflection. I'm going to go way too fast. Uh, for some of you, it'll feel like drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, it, it, and actually, people come up to me every time, and they're like, man, you talk so fast. How do you possibly do that? We couldn't even understand. Fortunately, um, David and some of the other guys here got copies of this. So a lot of the information that I'm going to go through tonight, you'll be able to read in more detail in this issue of the magazine. Uh, oh, there's the clicker. Thank you so much. Perfect. All right, so this will be good. Uh, but I will start with a joke, uh, because jokes are good. Um, so you have this guy. He gets up in a little balloon, you know, the hot air balloons, and he's floating around. And he floats for a while, and he realizes, oh, my goodness, I'm lost. I don't know where I am. So he looks down, and he sees a guy down there on his farm farming. He says, hey, you down there. Where am I? And the farmer is confused. He looks around. He doesn't see anything. He says, whoa, am I hearing stuff? Then the guy in the balloon again, hey, you down there. Where am I? And the farmer again gets really confused, and he's wondering, where is this guy? And then again, hey, you, where am I? And the farmer looks up. Finally, He's like, hey, you can't fool me. You're up there in that little basket. Right? So the point of the joke is that we need to be asking the right questions if we hope to get the right answers. Um, we have a very serious problem in our country. I think everybody here understands that. So what I want to do is go over you know, some of the people behind the scenes that I would say are responsible for a lot of this mess. And uh, what I hope to do by exposing these people is give you guys the tools to go out and do what needs to be done, which is get these guys out of public office, get these guys out of positions of power, and use the tools that are available to us under our Constitution and with our freedom of speech to, uh, to start reigning in the deep state. Uh, so we'll talk about a few different components of the deep state. We'll break it up into a few parts. But first, I want to say that this term deep state, I didn't come up with it, but it has become very, very popular. I, when I wrote this presentation maybe six or eight months ago, uh, the latest polls show that about half of Americans recognize that we have a deep state defined as uh, a group of people making policy beyond the reach of our government. Well, the latest poll I saw shows that 75% of Americans now recognize we have a deep state. That's three out of four Americans. Uh, younger Americans are are more likely to recognize this than older Americans. And that is really, really good news. The problem is that they don't understand the mechanics of it. So what I hope to do with this special issue, we put it on an ebook and with this presentation, is define the deep state for the American people so that we can understand the problem and ask the right questions. Um, so the deep state is real. Even a lot of the fake stream media has been admitting this lately. Uh, there is a deep state. Edward Snowden, you know, think what you like about him. It's a little bit weird that he's hiding in Russia. But uh, he says also that the deep state is real. But what is the actual deep state? Well, you know, a lot of these guys are talking about the bureaucracy. Uh, here, Dennis Kucinich, who's a Democrat, to show that this is not a partisan issue. In fact, a pretty left-wing Democrat says there is a deep state. This is a real thing. It's going after President Trump. This is not a partisan issue, and it's a threat to our republic. Uh, the FBI came out with a report right after I put this presentation together saying that they have actionable intelligence about a group of rogue bureaucrats all across the bureaucracy working to sabotage the elected president of the United States. Here's a guy who came up with the, uh, the term the deep state as applied to the United States, right? Because typically when we think of a deep state, we think of the Soviet Union or Pakistan or Egypt or some third world country. But this guy here, Mike Lofgren, who spent 30 years with a top secret security clearance in Capitol Hill, says, no, there's a deep state here in America too. And he defines it interestingly. He doesn't talk about the deep state behind the deep state, which is what I'm really going to focus on. But uh, he does expose a number of key things. And uh, David, you said I had an hour, right? So that gives me until... Is that 1045? I just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll figure that out, and then I'll keep a clock. You know, and they, they normally tell you, turn off your phones and put them away. I'll tell you, take out your phone and fact check everything I say. 50 minutes, okay. And then 10 for questions, right? 10 for questions. Okay, excellent. not talks. All right, very good. All right. So 50 minutes, that puts us at, my math skills are not good, but like 35 past. Okay, very good. Um, so this guy said, hey, there's a deep state in America, too. And um, he, he actually goes into some detail about what he considers to be the deep state. He talks about the intelligence agencies, and we'll go into some of that. Um, Rich Higgins, who was actually serving on the National Security Council, wrote a brilliant memo. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to get a copy of it and read it yourself, because it, it's crucial in outlining some of the problems that are facing the Trump administration 
and the American people. Uh, he defines the deep state as a successful outcome of cultural Marxism, a bureaucratic state beholden to no one, uh, certainly not the American people, no rule of law considerations. Uh, he talks about globalists and Islamists coming together using the media to destroy the President of the United States and also to destroy America as a nation and as an ideal. Because as we'll see, and we'll show some of them on video, they want to move toward what they call a new world order. I'm sure some of you guys have heard that term. I mean, we've had multiple presidents talking about it openly. And what uh, Rich Higgins essentially argued is that this whole bureaucratic machinery has now been turned against Trump. And so I'm not going to endorse or unendorse Trump, but uh, I think there's some very interesting things going on. Um, bureaucratic deep state, we won't spend much time on this just because I think it's one of the least important parts and it's one of the most well-known parts, but um, we have almost three million federal bureaucrats. That does not include our men and women in the armed services, and that does not include state and local bureaucrats, numbering about 20 to 25 million. Um, and this chart, I think, says it all. Right? This is the spending of federal employees in the 2016 election. The blue, as you probably have already inferred, is for Hillary Clinton. The red was for Donald Trump. So Trump is clearly not very popular with the bureaucracy that he now is supposed to be overseeing. Um, in fact, some of these bureaucracies, you just can't even imagine. 99.7% of the donations from bureaucrats at the Department of Education went to Hillary Clinton. These are the people educating your children. What do you suppose that they're having your children learn in their schools if they're so overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton? You can be sure it's not the Constitution, American history, et cetera. Um, and you know, the, you, the numbers go on. It's like 99% at a lot of the key bureaucracies, State Department, et cetera. Uh, they have close to half a million federal regulations with criminal penalties attached. Nobody actually knows how many there really are. Uh, when Congress tried to figure out, they asked the Congressional Research Service, how many regulations are, do we have that have criminal penalties? They said, well, we don't have the resources or the manpower to figure that out. So that's a problem, right? And uh, you know, we just heard about what they did to the Bundy family. So you can imagine they could do this to any one of us if we made them angry enough. Um, we have this book here, Three Felonies a Day, by uh, an attorney, Harvey Silvergate, and he says that the average American commits about three felonies per day without even realizing it. So everybody in this room, you know, we like to think, oh, well, jail is for criminals. Well, we could easily find ourselves in their situation if the government decided to come after us, if the deep state decided to come after us. For most of us, that's probably not a concern. They probably have bigger fish to fry. But if you threaten the deep state in a significant way, they might appoint a special counsel and say, hey, run wild, see what you can find. Right? And they might find tax problems from 2014, or they might find uh, all sorts of different things. Right? Um, here we have Robert Mueller. And um, I would say that he is a representative of the deep state. And I think what we're seeing now is he is trying to take down Trump's inner circle. He's already gotten some of the key people, uh, Mike Flynn who was Trump's original national security advisor, uh, was taken down in what I consider to be a rogue operation. And many more will probably come down if these people are allowed to continue. Uh, so we'll leave the bureaucracy behind because that's, you know, like I said, well known. But let's talk about the intelligence apparatus. This is another thing that's well known to some people, probably to most of the people in this room. And I always put this caveat, and I always get people come up to me afterwards and they say, man, I was in the CIA, thank you so much for the caveat. You know, I, I didn't figure out until the end of my career that this was going on. Uh, so what, I, what I'd like to say to start with is a lot of the guys who work in the intelligence agencies are good people. They're good, patriotic, decent, constitution-supporting Americans. Unfortunately, the problems are in the leadership level. Um, and this really came out during the Trump election and after Trump was elected. We really saw things that I think were unprecedented in American politics. Uh, we had, for example, an average of one national security leak per day from the time Trump took office. Uh, these people were deliberately trying to sabotage him. They were leaking stuff to the press. Now a lot more has come out. You know, some of these guys, Andrew McCabe, for example, was involved. He's now been removed and fired. But there are a lot of these guys within the highest levels of law enforcement and the intelligence apparatus that are determined to have the United States become this kind of province in this new world order, as we'll see. And they are very, very active in opposing Trump, who they think opposes their agenda, or at least is beyond their control. And so some of the unprecedented stuff that we saw, here's John Schindler. Uh, he's very active on Twitter. He was a, a guy in the intelligence bureaucracy. And um, Trump came out and criticized some of these intelligence agencies for all the leaks and you know all the rogue stuff that was going on. And this guy comes out. He says, now we're going to go nuclear, uh, intelligence community war going to new levels. He says, he just got an email from a senior intelligence community friend, and it began, he will die in jail. They're talking about President Trump. 
So who are these guys that think that they can put our president in jail and let him die there after the American people elected him? Well, this is kind of an open secret in Washington, right? And sometimes they let it slip. Here's Chucky e. Schumer, everybody's favorite uh, senator. And he says, let me tell you, you take on the intelligence community and they have six ways from Sunday for getting back at you. So who knew, right? Everybody in Washington knows that you take on the intelligence agencies and they have, quote, six ways from Sunday to get back at you. This is not how we're taught in civics class that our government works, right? They never told us that we have these intelligence agencies with six ways from Sunday to get back at their own boss, at the person the American people elected to supposedly oversee these agencies. That is very, very problematic. He said this on national television, by the way, with uh, Rachel Maddow. So the intelligence community is pretty massive, right? They have uh, something like a million people with top secret security clearances running around. Uh, a lot of these are private contractors who work in the intelligence machinery. A lot of them are good guys. Uh, they've also conscripted Silicon Valley, right? Facebook, YouTube, Google, all these things are working with the intelligence agencies to spy on all of you. Um, they have a, a nice place here in Utah that can hold, what is it, five uh, Yoda bytes of uh, of information that they're scooping up. We know that they've been listening to our phone calls, putting them in these computer systems. They've been getting our text messages, our emails. Um, and I want to debunk some of the important things here, because people think of the intelligence agencies, they think, well, we need somebody to keep us safe from the bad guys, right? And that's true. We probably do. Um, but let's look at this a little bit more in depth. Right now, the supposed threat that they're keeping us safe from is Islamic extremism. And that may well be a real threat. You know, we could talk about that. It's another topic for another day. But um, you know, ISIS was a big one, right? We need the intelligence community to keep us safe from ISIS. Well, in 2012, and this document was pried loose by Judicial Watch, they do some amazing work. Um, this was from the Defense Intelligence Agency. Incredible report. We know now that this was seen by top administration officials. And in this report, they say that the West, by which they mean the United States government, the British government, the French government, some of the European governments, uh, the Gulf countries, you know, the Islamic, uh, Sunni Islamic dictatorships on the Arabian Peninsula, and then the government of Turkey support the Syrian opposition. Okay, we knew that already. Uh, then they say that the Salafists, the Muslim Brotherhood, which they're trying to declare a terrorist organization right now, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which is a terrorist organization as defined by our State Department, are the major forces driving the insurgency in Syria. So here we have an admission that our own government is supporting an insurgency that's being driven primarily by known terrorist organizations. And then the real kicker is they say that there is the possibility of establishing a declared or undeclared Salafist principality. Salafism is this kind of hardcore Wahhabi Islam where you chop off your head if you've converted, things like that, um, in eastern Syria. And what this is exactly what the supporting powers to the opposition want. That's interesting. Here we can see their little Salafist principality, and you'll notice that it's in eastern Syria, and today we call it the Islamic State, right? So when Trump said that in many respects, ISIS is honoring President Obama, he's the founder of ISIS, uh, he founded ISIS, I would say co-founder would be Crooked Hillary, the media said, oh my goodness, how ridiculous, Trump is crazy, how could he even say something so ludicrous? Well, now we have smoking gun documents showing that Trump was right. And, um, you know, he stuck by his story for days when the media was ridiculing him and attacking him. So here we have smoking gun evidence, a document from the highest levels of our intelligence agencies admitting that they were supporting a revolution driven by a terrorist organization and that they wanted to create an Islamic state in eastern Syria. So rather than keeping us safe, they are in bed with the enemy, so to speak. Um, they use all sorts of nefarious methods. We'll get to the communism in a minute. But uh, a couple of things I wanted to highlight, and I could talk on the intelligence agencies all day. Um, they engage in false flag attacks, and they've actually, we have smoking gun documents that they've prepared false flag attacks. You can whip out your smartphone and read them yourself. Uh, we have Operation Northwoods. We have Operation Mongoose, where they were planning to blow up bombs in my hometown of Miami, Florida, and blame it on a foreign government for the purpose of starting a war. That's not okay, right? That is just simply not okay. Um, and the excuse then was to keep us safe from communism, right? They were going to get rid of Castro. Well, if they hadn't have been meddling in the first place, Castro wouldn't have been a problem. Uh, we know from the ambassador to Cuba during the Cuban Revolution that we, the United States, are responsible for bringing Castro to power. He wrote a whole book about it. It's called The Fourth Floor, talking about the role of the State Department, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the intelligence agencies in bringing this totalitarian dictator to power in Cuba. We betrayed our ally. 
We gave weapons and support. The Council on Foreign Relations had their propagandists working in the New York Times, uh, Herbert Matthews, telling us that Castro was a freedom fighter. He was like the George Washington of Cuba, right? One man recognized that Castro was a bloodthirsty communist. His name was Robert Welch. He was ridiculed for that. Oh, you conspiracy theorists, how could you say such a thing? The New York Times said he's a freedom fighter. And now we know, after the execution started, that he was actually a proud communist all along. Um, you know, again, the, the justification for all these intelligence agencies, at least 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, was to keep us safe from communism. Well, here's another anecdote, you know, and, it, and it's representative. I could go on on this for hours. But um, this guy, John Brennan, he was Obama's CIA director. And before he knew President Trump was going to be winning the election, he told the Congressional Black Caucus, oh, yeah, I voted for the Communist Party candidate in 1976, Gus Hall, and I told the CIA about it when I was applying for a job in my security clearance. So naturally, we would assume that since the CIA was keeping us safe from communists, they'd say, oh my goodness, this is an infiltrator. You can't come anywhere near the CIA. But instead, they let him in, they promoted him up the ranks until he ended up in charge of the agency that was supposed to be keeping us safe from communists. Uh, and you know, this story is just repeated over and over and over again. It's mind-blowing. Uh, so some of the crimes of the deep state, and I wish we had more time to go through them, but I really want to get to the deep state behind the deep state. Torture, mass murder, gun running, drug trafficking, illegal spying, kidnapping, regime change operations. Um, and, you know, again, back to the terrorist thing. This is all against terrorists, right? Well, who do they consider to be terrorists? I guarantee you that if you have a pulse and you have an opinion, you could be designated a terrorist by the U.S. government. In fact, during the Obama administration, we got a lot of documents telling us who they thought were terrorists. They had, we broke it down to 72 categories, pro-life activists, people who believe in states' rights, people who support the Constitution, Ron Paul supporters, Chuck Baldwin supporters, uh, opponents of a North American union, people who oppose the LGBT agenda, conspiracy theorists, people concerned about gun confiscation, anti-tax activists, evangelical Christians, et cetera, et cetera. Returning veterans even, right? I bet there's a few in this room. The government thinks you might be a potential terrorist. Isn't that nice that they're keeping us safe from you? Um, here, this is a presentation that was actually given to our soldiers by the Obama administration's Pentagon. You can read it for yourself, I think. Uh, they have religious extremism, and then you have some of the obvious ones, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Ku Klux Klan, things like that. And then you have evangelical Christians, Catholics, Orthodox Jews, right? Not what you would expect on a list of religious extremists. Um, here you have some of the torture that uh, the deep state has engaged in, in our name, with our money. I mean, this is criminal activity. This is a violation of federal and state law. There's no exemptions for, you know, well, we had to torture that guy. You know, it's just illegal. Uh, they have a network of secret prisons all around the world where they were torturing people. They kidnapped people off the streets. Some of them were convicted, actually, in absentia. Kidnap them, you know, just like in the movies. Put a bag over the guy's head, shove him into a van, ship him to Egypt so he could be tortured, uh, have his genitals electrocuted till the guy couldn't walk anymore. Then they let him out. Unbelievable stuff. And mass murder, you know, that's a really strong term, I realize that, but I can't think of any other term to describe what they've been doing. By their own admission, they have slaughtered thousands of people. Very few or none of them were ever charged with a crime. They were not taken to a court, they were not given an opportunity to contest the evidence, they were not tried by a jury of their peers, they were certainly not found guilty, and yet we're dropping bombs on them. Here's two of the victims of these bombing campaigns, right? They're flying their little remote control airplanes with dropping bombs on people. Uh, and actually, until a long drawn out fight involving Rand Paul and some others, they wouldn't even say, we're not gonna do that in the United States to Americans, right? Uh, that's how extreme these people have gotten. That's how bloodthirsty these people have gotten. These are two of the kids who were murdered using these uh, remote control drones. Both of them were born in the United States. Their only crime was being related to their father who allegedly made propaganda videos for Al Qaeda and put them on YouTube. So, you know, probably not a nice guy. Did his kids, American born, deserve to have missiles dropped on their head? Probably not. Um, here they brag about mass murder, right? I want you guys to see it on video. I, got, I have a few videos and I don't know that we'll have time for all of them, but I figure the best way is to let you guys this see it. This is all it. done under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. So it's, it's about a minute in, but you'll hear this guy talking about how they kill people. Ways. As I said, in oh, and I should say while they're talking, the Michael Hayden, the guy who's going to make the comments that I want to draw attention to, he ran the CIA, he ran the NSA, he he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a regular attendee at the Bilderberg Group, and, gives it an okay and we can listen to what he has to okay, say here. And it is on a time limit. General Hayden, you can find out all these things David just said about me, about David, about anyone in this audience. That is a function of operational capability. I'd like you to talk about whether you're comfortable with that operational capability, if so, why, 
and how often is it used in the ways that David described? Yeah, first, first of all, David's description of what you can do with metadata and quoting a mutual friend, Stuart Baker, is absolutely correct, okay? We kill people based on metadata. There you go, straight from the horse's mouth. We kill people based on metadata, right? No longer do we have to build cases and get a conviction and have a death penalty sentence. Now we kill people based on their metadata. So you better check your metadata, make sure you didn't say anything that makes them suspicious of you. Um, William Binney, he was a high-ranking official at the NSA, and uh, he decided to become a whistleblower early on in the Bush administration. He said, oh my goodness, this is not what I signed up for. They're spying on every American. They're vacuuming up 80% of your phone calls, putting them in these massive uh, data warehouses they have, uh, almost all of your emails, right? And that doesn't mean that they're reading all of your emails right now, but with the emergence of artificial intelligence and supercomputing, you can bet that this stuff is going to be used to build assessments and profiles on every person in the United States. Uh, this is a totalitarian's dream. This is a nightmare for privacy, for individual liberty, and for even being able to, to maintain our liberties. Uh, he said he could not stay there. It was a direct violation of our Constitution, and he had to blow the whistle. Um, even our Congress is not safe. Even deep state apologists in our Congress are not safe from this. Uh, this is Dianne Feinstein, right? Not a real liberty-loving patriot, not a real threat to the establishment, but in 2014, her congressional committee was doing an investigation into the CIA's torture. Of course, torture is a crime. Well, we found out, she found out, that the CIA had hacked into their computers, was spying on all her staffers, was deleting evidence from their computers, from their investigation, and this is a member of Congress. If they'll do this to a high-ranking, well-known, Democratic member of Congress, they can do it to anybody in this room. They can do it to anybody, including potentially the President of the United States or a Supreme Court Justice. And imagine what they can do with that information. You know, do you suppose every member of Congress is squeaky clean? Do you suppose some of them have had extramarital affairs or skeletons in their closet? Well, imagine what they could do with that information. Hey, oh, you don't want to vote for that. You wouldn't want your picture on the front page of your local newspaper with that girl you were with, right? Uh, so dangerous stuff here. Um, Project Gunrunner, right? Operation Gunrunner. These guys got caught shipping heavy weaponry to Mexican drug cartels. When they got caught, they said, oh, well, we were doing an investigation, right? We were going to track those guns somehow. And uh, then you look a little further and you find out the guy they were investigating was already on the FBI's payroll. They weren't investigating squat. They were sending our guns to Mexico so that a lot of people would end up dead and they could say, look, Americans and their Second Amendment are responsible for this bloodbath. And you notice they stopped saying that after they got caught, right? Um, and many, many members of Congress, even the NRA came out and said this was a false flag operation. This was for the purpose of demonizing gun rights and implementing new restrictions. In fact, they were implementing new restrictions based on the chaos that they unleashed. Uh, they've been caught drug dealing and drug running. The head of the DEA went on national television, Robert Bonner, on CBS, said, hey, we caught the CIA importing a ton, one ton of cocaine into the United States on an airplane in cooperation with the Venezuelan government. Uh, there are no exemptions in federal law for importing cocaine into the United States if you happen to work for the CIA. That is a crime. Then they use this money to fund revolutions, to fund terror organizations, to fund subversion in other countries. Unbelievable stuff. And this is just what we know about, right? Imagine what remains hidden behind the scenes. Uh, one reporter, Gary Webb, tried to expose all this. He wrote a book, wrote a series of newspaper articles. He committed suicide with two bullets in his head. And you almost wonder, do they do that just so that everybody with a brain realizes that this is what happens? And I'm convinced that that's what they do. You know, the people who are asleep will say, oh, okay. Everybody with a brain will say, oh, okay. Uh, so anyways, um, John Kerry even said, yep, they were definitely trafficking cocaine, no question. Uh, so they overthrow governments all the time. Uh, they helped create the European Union. We have the declassified documents now proving they were funneling our tax dollars to front groups and astroturf movements in, the, in Europe to convince these governments to surrender their sovereignty and create a European Union. Surrender their sovereignty and build this crucial building block in the new world order. And you'll see that they outline their strategy frequently, right? You gotta regionalize the world and then you move toward the full global system. Uh, on the left here, you have an artist's rendition of the Tower of Babel and the two pictures on the right that one right there is an official propaganda poster of the European Union. It says, Europe, many tongues, one voice, right? The resemblance with the Tower of Babel is more than coincidental. And then over here, you have the EU Parliament building in Strasbourg, which was consciously built to be modeled after the Tower of Babel. Well, if you've read your Bible, you know what God thought about the Tower of Babel. He wasn't pleased. 
right? Um, they've also engaged in mind control experiments, MK Ultra. They shredded most of the documents, but we have some of them. We know they were doing horrifying experiments on people, giving LSD to mental patients, monstrous things uh, under the guise of studying mind control. We know that they've been involved in propaganda since the 50s, right? We found out they were engaged in Operation Mockingbird. We have some of the documents, again, where they had 400 journalists on the payroll of the CIA producing propaganda for American audiences, right? I mean, top journalists, people you would not even think of. Here's William F. Buckley. I bet there's some fans of Buckley in the room. CIA employee recruited in 1951, member of the Council on Foreign Relations, member of the Skull and Bone Secret Society, all of which we'll discuss later. Uh, so when you really want to try to unweave the strands here, you got to look at the money. So we'll spend a minute on the money. Um, Georgetown University professor Carol Quigley wrote an incredible book. I have it in my library, and it's a little bit boring, but there's some incredible revelations in there that's massive. Uh, Bill Clinton thanked him. He said, this was my mentor, Bill Quigley, right? And he wrote in his book that he disagrees with the secrecy, but he agrees with the overall aims of this network he calls the Anglo-American Establishment. And uh, he put some of his findings in this book. He said he was allowed to examine their papers for years, and he agrees with what they're doing. He just didn't want it to be secret says these people had a far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. The system was going to be controlled in feudalist fashion through uh, secret meetings, and uh, the apex of this was going to be the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, which is a private bank owned by the central banks of the world, which are themselves private banks. And if you don't believe the Federal Reserve is a private bank, sue them in court and see what they say. I have the documents. They say, well, we're not a government entity. We don't have to comply with Freedom of Information Act. We're a private company with a private board, and we have shareholders, and they appoint our leaders. So. Um, Mike Lofgren, who we mentioned earlier, uh, he said that Washington is the most important node of the deep state, but it's only one of them, and Wall Street is another crucial one. Uh, we know that these mega banks are too big to jail, and I want to mention some names here because people say, well, who are these people? Well, the Rothschild name is a good one to know. Uh, they have been at the center of a lot of this for a long time. We all know George Soros, right? Well, not a lot of people know that George Soros got his initial funding from the Rothschild dynasty. Uh, my friend uh, Joe Wolverton, who I'm sure some of you guys know, wrote an excellent article about that in The New American. So Soros got his start with Rothschild money. Uh, they brag on their website, right, for one of their banks, that they've been at the center of the world's financial markets for more than 200 years. Uh, they say they can be closer to current issues than any other global financial institution. And here's an apologist for the Rothschilds, uh, a globalist writer and uh, historian, Niall Ferguson. He wrote uh, a book about the Rothschilds, and he said that they decided the outcome of the Napoleonic Wars by putting their financial weight behind Britain. So these were the two most powerful governments on the planet at that time, and this family of banking interests was able to decide the outcome of a war between the two most powerful governments on the planet. You would think somebody would be talking about them. That's some pretty serious power. And they maintain much of their power today, although you don't hear about them in the news. Um, we know Baron Eric de Rothschild, one of the descendants, he, uh, I came across him totally by accident because he was promoting a known Communist Party operative from Bulgaria. This regime, Communist regime in Bulgaria, murdered hundreds of thousands of people. He wanted this woman, Irina Bokova, whose father was on the Politburo, who was trained at an elite school for the KGB in Moscow, to run the United Nations. She was running UNESCO at the time, which is the UN agency developing global education standards. Um, so we think of the, all these corporations as kind of these independent entities in a competitive free market system. Unfortunately, looks can be deceiving. Uh, there was a really great study that came out of Switzerland, published in PLOS1, which is an open source uh, peer-reviewed journal, and they looked at the ownership and the control structure of these mega corporations. And what they found is that they're all controlled, or not all, but I think 80%, they said, were controlled by this, what they called an economic super entity, right? These interlocking boards, you have interlocking systems of ownership where these mega banks and their group of agents basically run all these mega international corporations that on the surface we think of as just independent companies doing their own thing. Uh, I encourage you to look at the study. It's a very complex. Here's some of the graphics they tried to put together to represent what this structure looks like. But, uh, I mean, this is very important to understanding the money system here. Um, and then we think, well, communism, right? There was two poles. There was the capitalist world and the communist world. Well, in this book, uh, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, Anthony Sutton, a historian from Stanford, exposes the fact that our mega bankers here in Wall Street were funding the revolutionaries in the Soviet Union. And for me, this was a crucial puzzle piece in figuring out how the world really works, right? When you recognize that behind the communists was 
another conspiracy, right? The international communist conspiracy was not operating all on its own. There were powers behind it that supported it from the beginning. Then you start to realize that the world does not work the way we were taught in school. Uh, the Federal Reserve and the central banks are one of the key money mechanisms to keep this whole deep state and the deep state behind the deep state afloat. Um, you know, I think probably a lot of you guys understand how they work. They create money out of thin air. They loan it out at interest. They manipulate interest rates. They create as much currency as they want. They cause inflation. They confiscate the wealth of the American people. They bail out their cronies. Uh, I mean, it's basically a massive criminal operation that exists to pump the wealth from the American people, especially the poor and the middle class, to the super elites, what I'll call the deep state behind the deep state. Um, and there's the value of the dollar, right? In 1913, a dollar was worth a dollar. Today, it's lost 96% of its purchasing power. Uh, so we have been robbed. So what do they do with all this money that they're fleecing us for? Well, they put it in tax-exempt foundations so that they don't have... That's why all these mega billionaires, George Soros, Michael Bloomberg, all the rest of them, are so happy about high taxes because you're going to pay them, not them, right? They put their money in tax-exempt foundations so that they don't end up paying the taxes, and then they use this money to fund the global warming movement, for example, or to fund subversion or to fund the takeover of our education system. How do we know? Because Congress has done the investigations, and they understand covered all of this. You just didn't read it on the front page of the New York Slimes or the Washington Compost. Um, in 2014, the Senate Environment Committee put together a report, and they, they described what they call the Billionaires Club. Um, they identified some of these people. They said, this is not even necessarily legal, but what they've done is they've created a green movement to undermine our private property rights, to do some of uh, what we heard about earlier today, right? Get Americans off of their land, lock everything up, lock all the resources up, put them out of reach. Uh, you have Bill Gates, who, of course, funded Common Core, put $2 billion of his own money into nationalizing our education system, further dumbing down our education system. You have George Soros, who's got his you know, fingerprints all over everything, self-described God, uh, went on national television and said he felt no guilt about helping the Nazis expropriate property when he was younger. Uh, unbelievable. Funds all kinds of uh, pseudo-Christian organizations, Catholics for choice, right? I don't know if we have any Catholics in the room, but Catholics can't be for choice, right? Because choice involves murdering a human being. And yet Soros funds all these fake Christian groups to corrupt Christian churches and Christian denominations. Uh, this has not been secret for a long time. In 1952, our Congress did a study. Um, I encourage you to watch an interview with the lead investigator, Norman Dodd. He did an hour-long interview with G. Edward Griffin, and he lays out the mechanics of this. Um, what he says is, as soon as he got appointed, uh, the head of the Ford Foundation, Alan Geithner, summoned him to his office and said, hey, Mr. Dodd, uh, you know, I'll just tell you what we're doing. We are working to use our grant-making power to so alter life in the United States that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. And that's what they've been doing. Uh, they've taken over our education system. In fact, this report concluded that there had already been a revolution, that it would not have been possible without these foundations seizing control of our education systems and indoctrinating and brainwashing our people. Um, they said that these foundations were uh, pushing oligarchical collectivism, subversion, socialism. Uh, and we outline a lot of this in a book that I wrote with my friend uh, and colleague, the late Sam Blumenfeld, how they have been now for generations. They seized control of our education system with a lot of Rockefeller money, people like John Dewey, uh, and they have been dumbing down the American people for going on 100 years now. The process is incredible. I mean, the government itself admits that about 50% of Americans either can't read or are so close to not being able to read that we might as well consider them illiterate. That did not happen by accident. That was an orchestrated, very careful takeover of our education system funded by many of these same people through these same foundations. Uh, the Rockefeller family through, gave, through the uh, General Education Board gave $3 million to John Dewey to experiment with these ideas and hijack the education system. This is why our kids are getting dumber. This is why our kids don't know anything about our history. They don't know anything about our Constitution. They're out marching in the streets demanding that their rights be infringed upon. This is exactly why. So uh, I have four copies of the book outside. If anybody wants one, uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to give you that. Then we have uh, Deep State Behind the Deep State. This is what I really want to focus on. Let me see how much time I have. Okay, about 20 minutes. Um, so we have... Semi-secret societies, semi-secret organizations, and then secret societies. I'll start with the semi-secret organizations. Um, but before I do that, you know, before anyone calls me a conspiracy theorist, I want to bring up David Rockefeller, because he, you know the old joke about David Rockefeller, why didn't he run for president? Well, he didn't want a demotion, right? That's how much power this guy has accumulated. Um, He's, he's dead now. You know, he went to go meet his maker last year, and I can't imagine that went well. But uh, he says in his book, 
Some even believe that we, the Rockefeller family, are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, that his family and me are internationalists, conspiring, there's that word, conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic system. One world, if you will. This is on page 405. You can pick it up yourself at a library. He says, if that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. So, you know, they know half of us can't read, and, you know, half of the ones who can read don't read, so they feel safe, uh, you know, hiding these secrets in their autobiographies. But this is incredible. He just, by his own admission, he is a conspirator conspiring against the best interests of his own country with a secret cabal, in his words, of internationalists to build a one-world order. So there's no conspiracy. This is out in the open now. Conspiracy, by definition, requires secrecy, and there's no theory. This is a fact. The guy who's helping to ringlead it is openly bragging about it. Here it is straight from the book. You can pick up a copy. Um, and then back to Carol Quigley. He says, there does exist and has existed for a generation an Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way that the radical right, that would be all of us, <laughs> uh, believe the Communist Act. And this network, we can identify it as the round table groups, has no aversion to cooperating with communists and frequently does so. Another interesting admission. And this roundtable groups, I mean, there's a lot of history here. You can go back to Cecil Rhodes, the mining magnate in Southern Africa, left a lot of money to set up this network around the world. In the United States, the key outpost of this network is called the Council on Foreign Relations. This was founded in 1921 after our Senate refused to get us in an entangling alliance with the League of Nations. And um, this is a key organization. I mean, they, they have less than 5,000 members, but these people dominate every administration, be it Republican, be it Democrat. They have people on the Supreme Court, all the big media, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here you can hear Hillary Clinton. Thank you very much, um, Richard. And I am delighted to be here in these new headquarters. Um, I have been often to, uh, I guess, the mothership in New York City. Uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. I mean, That's a pretty bold admission. The, the, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, tells her what she should be doing and how she should be thinking about the world. And here we thought voters did that, right? <laughs> how silly of us. Here's Darth it's Vader. To be I mean, Dick Cheney, Council sorry. Council on Foreign Relations, as uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. <laughs> See, they all laugh. They think it's so funny. <laughs> That's funny. Well, here's some of the members. Uh, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, Tim Geithner, Paul Volcker, and on and on the list goes. Will Crystal, right, the guy from Weekly Standard, John McCain, Condoleezza Rice, Dick Cheney, Colin Powell. You can read the list yourself. Pretty incredible. Uh, Democrats, Republicans, makes no difference. Um, they're all part of this little thing, and we're not. Um, so here's from the administrations, you know, just some numbers so you can get a feel for how they dominate. And I mean, these are top positions, right? Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of State, uh, you know, all the important jobs are filled by CFR people. We'll see what happens with the Trump administration. There's a lot less than there have been. Uh, there are some, but there's a lot less. Uh, they very conveniently provide a membership roster. So if you have someone running for Congress and you want to find out good or bad, you can start right here. You know, if they're on this list, you can be almost sure that you don't want them representing you. Uh, and we have um, Admiral Chester Ward, who was a member for 16 years. He was a judge advocate general for the Navy. Uh, wrote a book about this. He left the CFR and he said, the main purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations is promoting the disarmament of U.S. sovereignty and our national independence and the submergence of our nation into an all-powerful one-world government. He says, this lust to surrender the sovereignty and the independence of the United States is pervasive throughout most of the membership. So maybe not everybody who's involved in CFR believes this, but most of them do. Um, they admit it in their own magazines, right? If you want to find out what the policy of the U.S. government is going to be, read this magazine. Several years before it becomes official policy, they outline it here in this magazine. And here they admit it. In short, the House of World Order is going to have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. An end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish more than the old-fashioned assault. So they recognize that they can't just come out and say, hey, just kidding, guys, your whole country is all dissolved. We're all going to be part of a happy new world order. they got to do it piece by piece. And they recognize that because the American people wouldn't stand for it otherwise. If you want to learn more about this, there's a great book, The Shadows of Power. And then we have a reprint of uh, a cover story we did on the Council on Foreign Relations in the New American Magazine. 
Um, another group I want to talk to you about briefly is the Trilateral Commission. It's like the CFR, but it brings together leaders of Western Europe and leaders of Japan. Uh, but it, it, it plays functionally the same role, right, moving us toward a global system of government. Um, this was founded in 1973. Uh, David Rockefeller, who we mentioned earlier, he had read a book by this guy, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who also passed away last year and went to meet his maker, and can't imagine that one went well either. And um, in this book, uh, America's Role in the Technocratic Age, he basically argues that America is obsolete, the Soviet Union has some problems, but Marxism is not really that bad. It's actually the next step in human evolution. It's going to be real fun. And that we need, essentially, a global system. He wanted to bring the communist and non-communist worlds together, and he actually outlines this process. He's done it in public multiple times, including at uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's 1995 summit. We've got to organize the world into regional governments, and Henry Kissinger reiterated this very recently in a book called World Order. Break up the world into regional governments, European Union, African Union, Union of South American States, Putin right now is building the Eurasian Union. Anywhere you look in the world, they're building these little unions. They're trying here in the United States, using NAFTA as the basis for it. Um, and then from there, merge it all into a single global system. Um, we have non-secret groups that are involved in this that I don't have time to talk about. The World Affairs Council, the Aspen Institute, Brookings Institution, Club of Rome, the World Economic Forum. They actually have now, believe it or not, a world government summit. Um, I've, I'm one of the few in America. I think I might have been the only American journalist who wrote about this monstrosity last year. And um, I mean, this is incredible. You had the head of the UN, the head of the IMF, the head of the World Bank, all these globalists and running these mega corporations, having a world government summit. They built a replica of the Arch of Baal. If you've read your Bible, you probably know something about Baal. And they met under this giant Arch of Baal in the Arabian Peninsula to talk about how they were going to move us toward world government. And yet, CNN was a co-sponsor of this event. Um, Rupert Murdoch's Sky News was a co-sponsor of this event. And yet, not a peep about it in the American media. Here's Bilderberg. You actually have this graphic in the reprint of the magazine here. Um, Bilderberg, and I've been to two of them, uh, once as an uninvited guest, once as just a journalist who was forced to sit outside. Um, but I got to talk to some of them. And uh, basically, 120 to 150 of the most powerful people in the world get together once a year, and uh, they have their little secret meetings, and they plot out the future of humanity. And they admit later that they plot out the future of humanity in these secret meetings. Um, you have basically all, you know, big bankers, you have presidents, you have prime ministers, you have foreign ministers, secretaries of state. Uh, all these guys come together, uh, kings, queens, CEOs, spy chiefs, military chiefs, etc. And uh, they all have one thing in common, a devotion to globalism. Uh, they also apparently do job interviews for our politicians, right? Uh, in 1991, Bill Clinton showed up. Nobody knew who Bill Clinton was if you weren't from Arkansas. He was just some no-name governor. And Bill Clinton shows up, and then suddenly he's paraded on all our television screens. Hey, guys, this guy will make a great president. And sure enough, he became our president. Um, you had the uh, same thing with Tony Blair. Showed up at Bilderberg one year, no-name member of parliament from the UK, and suddenly, hey, he's going to be your next prime minister. Uh, this happens over and over and over again. Obama went in 2008, uh, just all the time. Then the BBC even told us that all the recent presidents of the European Commission attended Bilderberg before they were appointed. So some interesting stuff going on there. Here's some of the guys who go. Um, here's some of the uh, attendees. Uh, you'll notice Jeff Bezos, right, the owner of the Washington Compost, owner of Amazon. Trump has been uh, giving him a hard time lately, crushing the stock. <laughs> Full disclosure, I own some Amazon stock, but I, I don't mind him doing that. I, I think uh, this guy needs to be called out. But look at these names. I mean, David Betrayus, Kissinger, Bill Gates, the guy who runs Microsoft, Lindsey Graham, uh, John McCain, Keith Alexander, who was running the NSA, Michael Hayden, the guy we heard bragging about how they kill people based on their metadata. Right, uh, Bill Clinton, and on and on the list goes. Uh, nowadays, they've started publishing press releases. I actually talked to this guy. He's the leader of the Dutch Labor Party. I was at the Bilderberg meeting in Copenhagen, and he came out and wanted to talk to journalists for whatever reason. And uh, Bilderberg says that, hey, these are private meetings. Everybody's here in their private capacity, so no press allowed, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then this guy comes out. I'm like, hey, so you're in there in a private capacity? He says, oh, no, no, no. I'm formal because being a politician, you're 24-7, so there's no way of exiting my role. So he came out and discredited the entire premise that allows them to shield themselves from scrutiny, uh, essentially admitted that the American attendees were violating the Logan Act without meaning to do it. Um, here this, and I have tons of quotes from these people because they come out and they kind of rub it in your face. Uh, the former British Chancellor of the Exchequer, 
Um, he bragged to The Guardian, a big British newspaper, big left-wing paper. Uh, it's a little bit exaggerated, but not wholly unfair to say that we're working for a world government. And then he points out that, oh, they're just doing it for our own good because we're all too stupid, and if we don't submit to their world government, we'll just go on killing each other forever. So how nice, right? They're just worried about our, our well-being. Um, then the Bilderberg chairman, Etienne uh, Davignon, uh, bragged that they helped create the euro, helped create the European Union. Um, they admitted that uh, they basically, when you go to Bilderberg, you automatically have around the table internationalists. And I could go on about Bilderberg. Uh, Skull and Bones is another one that I want to mention briefly. This is a secret society. Here's a picture of some of their guys. You notice their nice little logo there, right? Nice group of people. <laughs> Proverbs. Um, so anyways. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go on. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, look, I look for... Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. You both were members of Spell and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Okay, so uh, they call themselves the Brotherhood of Death. Sounds like a club I'd want to join. Um, <laughs> right? uh, there's some speculation that this might have been related to the Illuminati, which was a historical organization we'll talk about briefly. Uh, some of the rituals that have come out on tape, people have tried to kind of sneak up on the roof and film. Really weird stuff. You know, they, uh, I, I won't even talk about some of it. It's just highly inappropriate, but it involves uh, you know, weird sexual things and death-related things. Uh, very, very strange. Uh, some of the people who've been involved in this secret society uh, Secretary of Treasury Steve Mnuchin is actually a member. Uh, George H.W. Bush, um, the founder of the CIA, William Buckley, founder of the National Review, um, you know, on and on and on. Um, of course, George Bush, uh, Rock, uh, what's his name, John Kerry, uh, President Taft, and on and on, a whole bunch of cabinet secretaries. And um, Anthony Sutton, a historian we mentioned earlier from Stanford, um, he at first said, oh, that's a conspiracy theory, but uh, Charlotte Iserbid, I think some of you probably know her, um, her dad and her granddad were members, and so when they died, she ended up with this list of all the attendees and some of the documents. She gave them to Anthony Sutton, and he said, oh my goodness, this is America's secret establishment. They're conspiring for a world government. He says basically they have this dialectical process where they try to control the right side of the conversation and the left side of the conversation so that you can steer the ultimate uh, objective where you want it, right? So you have, here's one perspective that's allowed, here's the other, anything outside of that is extremist, is radical, is not even worth talking about on television, and that way they can arrive at the predetermined conclusion. Um, the Bohemian Grove is another one of these secretive organizations. 2,500 of the most powerful men in the world show up every year to the Redwood Forest of Northern California. Here's a picture of them doing a strange ritual. Uh, Alex Jones, radio host, snuck in one year with a video camera and filmed these people doing their little ritual. Uh, you know, some of the stuff that came out, you know, they run around naked in the woods and they pee on trees and they call that freedom. Uh, you know, weird stuff, but, you know, okay, whatever. Drunken frat kids do that too. But this, this is weird. Um, we'll, we'll watch a brief video of it uh, in a moment. Uh, so it was founded uh, after the Civil War. Uh, they now have 2,500 of the most powerful people involved. Uh, total secrecy is demanded. Um, every Republican president since the 1920s, with the exception of President Trump, has been an attendee at this Bohemian Grove, and many Democrats as well. Um, cabinet officials, CEOs, all the rest of it. Um, here you can watch them. Well, it's, it's quite a long video, but maybe we could watch just a second of it. This is what Alex Jones filmed when he snuck in through the forest. Suddenly, all around the owl, activity began. Here is the main central part of the ritual. So anyways, we don't have a lot of time, but if you listen long enough, you hear these horrifying, blood-curdling screams. Uh, they say it's a human effigy, not a real baby, but, uh, you know, very weird, right? I don't know why you would stand in front of a 40-foot concrete owl and chant weird things in a robe and a hood. and Very, very weird. Here's a picture. They were doing this in the early 1900s. Uh, here it is in the daylight. You can see their big owl there. Um, super weird stuff. So, you know, if you're not a believer, you know, okay, you got to explain this. If you've read your Bible, I think you have a pretty solid understanding of what's going on here. Um, their little motto, weaving spiders come not here, right? So it's supposed to leave business cares and political stuff outside. And yet Richard Nixon, um, he wrote in his autobiography that his most important speech was given at the Bohemian Grove. Most Americans didn't even know it existed. Uh, and then in private tapes, I don't know if you guys ever heard those, but he called it the most, I won't even say it, but he, uh, he didn't have nice things to say about it. <laughs> 
So Ford, Kissinger, Schultz, all these guys are regular attendees. In the fall um, of 2004, David Gergen, who was an advisor of four York, presidents, kind of the Carl Rove Republican of four different National presidents. Convention. Alex Jones confronted him about David it on the street. Gergen, he saw him the there. Carl Rove of four presidential Well, anyways, he, he confronts him. He says, oh, you were at the Bohemian Grove. And the guy said, oh, you're not supposed to talk about that. You, know, you took an agreement. He said, I didn't take an agreement. I came through the woods. So you were trespassing. I don't respect you for that. So he was really upset. Um, <laughs> And here's the best possible endorsement of Trump that I could ever hope for. Uh, somebody hacked into Colin Powell's emails, and I, I don't endorse hacking, but, you know, it was funny. Uh, he wrote an email to his friend up in Canada, um, Gordon, Peter Gordon McKay, who was a minister of justice, all these other things. He said, I was at the Bohemian Grove, and I sat next to Stephen Harper, who was the prime minister of Canada, supposedly conservative. And he says, um, Grove attendees know that Trump is a disaster. So there you go. Trump doesn't go, and they don't like him. So as far as I'm concerned, that's good, right? So we may not agree with him on everything, but at least he's not part of the club. And actually, Newt Gingrich, who has been involved with a lot of these deep state machineries, uh, he went on Fox News. He said the reason the establishment hates him so much is because he's not part of their little secret societies and he hasn't participated in their little secret rituals. So that makes me happy. I like my president to not be involved in that stuff. Uh, anyways, we'll talk briefly about the Illuminati. This is a real thing. Whether it still exists today or not, I don't know. Founded in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt, a professor of law. Uh, there's a very great book about this that I highly encourage you to read. Uh, it's called uh, Proofs of a Conspiracy uh, by a high-ranking Freemason from England. And what he said was this Illuminati, this secret society, was infiltrating the Masonic lodges of Europe for the purpose of subverting every national government and every religion in Europe and bringing about uh, you know, this weird thing they call the Brotherhood of Man, essentially a global totalitarian government. And if you look at the objectives, you'll notice that they have a lot in common with the Communist Manifesto and the Ten Planks, right? They basically want to get rid of families, get rid of private property, get rid of nations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, George Washington knew about the Illuminati and was concerned about it. He warned in a letter, and this is available on the government's own archival webpage, it's not my intention to doubt that the doctrine of the Illuminati and the principles of Jacobinism had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more satisfied of this fact than I am. Um, a friend of George Washington, a minister, had sent him that book, Proofs of a Conspiracy. George Washington read it and said, oh my goodness. So the Illuminati was uh, one of the big forces we behind the French the Revolution. We to forge for ourselves and for future generations. A new world we'll watch order. just a minute of this. It's a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. It is a big idea, a new world order, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States. Uh, anyway, it goes on and on. All these you know, very famous people, prime ministers, presidents, etc., saying new world order. But I want to point you to what, what Bush said just real quickly. He talked about a world in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role, that's double speak for war making role, right? They had the UN has got the peace armies that are famous for raping children, murdering civilians, et cetera, all over the world, uh, to bring about a world in which the principles of the UN's founders can be realized. Well, if we know anything about the UN's founders, we know we had Stalin on one side, right? One of the worst mass murdering butchers to ever curse this planet. And then on our side, we sent a, a, a guy called Alger Hiss. He was so important that they actually made him the first secretary general of the United Nations. And then later he was convicted for being a Soviet spy. So he was working for Stalin all along. Why we would want a world order in which the principles of the UN's founders would become the global system is beyond me. Um, so here's some of the swamp creatures or potential swamp creatures in Trump's administration. Uh, Justice Gorsuch is an interesting question. I don't know whether he's good or bad. Uh, I do know that he was a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. For whatever reason, he was not... Um, admitted to being a life member. Whether that was his choice or the choice of his colleagues at the CFR, I don't know. Uh, but you have a whole bunch of these guys. H.R. McMaster has now been replaced. Uh, Robert Litziger, the, the U.S. Trade Representative, who's working to double down on NAFTA. Uh, Elaine Chow, Transportation Secretary. Uh, Dina Habib Powell, who has since been uh, moved somewhere else. Rick Perry, uh, Steve Mnuchin, Skull and Bones. Uh, you have James Mattis, who went to Bilderberg. You have Wilbur Ross, who was a managing director for Rothschild, Inc. Um, 
So is Trump a swamp creature or not? I don't know. I know uh, I have a friend here who is firmly convinced he is. I, I am not convinced of that. But I was talking to Roger Stone. I had some meetings with him. He said the deep state hates Trump so badly they will do anything to get rid of him. He said they have three plans. Plan A, get rid of him using the Mueller investigation. That doesn't look like it's going to work. Plan B, call him crazy and remove him under the 25th Amendment. That kind of didn't work either. Now he says plan C is to just do what they did to John F. Kennedy, put a bullet in him, and, uh, and call it a day. So what do we do about this? Um, and this is my last couple minutes here. You know, I, and this is just my opinion. I mean, you guys all have opinions on what we ought to do about this, too. Uh, but these are my opinions for what they're worth. Uh, I would say that we need to educate ourselves. We need to read. We need to read our Bibles and our constitutions and our Declaration of Independence. And we need to know economics and theology and philosophy and our history and science and all the rest of it. And that's a lot. I realize that. But you know, Sun Tzu, very smart guy. So if you don't know yourself, you don't know your enemy, you're going to lose every battle. If you know yourself, but you don't know your enemy, you'll lose one, you'll win one. But if you know yourself and you know your enemy, you'll win every battle. So we need to know the enemy, which, you know, I think the deep state behind the deep state is a big part of it. Uh, and we know ourselves, as in our constitution and our history and where we come from, uh, we will have a much better chance of succeeding than we will if we remain ignorant. So we need to educate our children. I advocate that everybody protect their own kids from the indoctrination going on in the schools. Homeschool them if you can. Put them in a good private school, a good Christian school if you can. Get them out of the government schools. Uh, we need to educate others, our neighbors, our friends, opinion molders in particular. Uh, subscribe to the New American Magazine. And I say that because the New American Magazine is awesome, not because I write for it. Um, Constitution is the solution, right? We can use the Constitution to rein in a lot of this illegitimate power that they've usurped. Uh, we can use state nullification to rein in the feds as well. If our state governments would stand up and say no to the feds, that would really, really help put a check on these things. Um, then... Um, what else? We can take back Congress, right? All we need is 218 good guys in the House of Representatives, and we can shut down almost all of this very quickly. Uh, I highly recommend getting involved with the John Birch Society if you're not involved already. It's named after Captain John Birch, who was a missionary to China, murdered by communists. Um, he, uh, he actually joined in World War II, joined the military, military intelligence. And what we do is we try to educate the American people, educate the electorate so that we can elect better people. Uh, Robert Welch, the founder of the Birch Society, said that what we need to do is expose the people who are behind this if we want to stop it. And then this is the last thing I want to say. If we don't recognize that there's a spiritual component to this battle, we're really missing the point. Um, and so I turn to Ephesians 6, 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. If we don't understand that part of it, we're going to miss the mark, and we're not going to understand what's going on. So we need to be very active. We need to be praying. We need to be teaching other people about the Bible and about God's Word. We need to humble ourselves, as God's Word tells us in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. We need to share the good news of Christ with others. Get active in your church. And then one last little bit of good news. You know, I, I realize this is a pretty down presentation, right? Everybody leaves like, oh, man, that's terrible. We're in big trouble. But no, we shouldn't leave that way. Uh, God tells us in Psalm 2, 2, that the kings of the earth are conspiring against the Lord and his anointed. And that sounds scary until we realize that in Psalm 2, 4, the one enthroned in the heavens laughs and the Lord ridicules them. So God thinks these people are funny. All their little schemes are nothing. And uh, we need to get busy exposing them, doing what God told us to do, reprove them. But uh, we can do it. So thank you guys very much and God bless.